Early in the morning, Qantas Flight 32 arrived in Singapore for a scheduled stopover on its marathon journey from London to Sydney. During the stop, it refueled, took on passengers, and welcomed a new flight crew for the final leg to Australia. The plane was nearly full, with 440 of the 450 passenger seats occupied, along with a substantial complement of 29 crew members, including no fewer than five pilots. Normally, the A380 is operated by just two pilots. November 4th, 2010, Changi International Airport, Singapore. It's 9 a.m. and here stands a gleaming A380 of Qantas, ready to depart for Sydney. The A380, a double-deck four-engine aircraft that entered service in 2007, is by far the largest passenger plane in the world, surpassing the acclaimed Boeing 747 in nearly every measurement. Most major airlines dismiss the behemoth as too large for their operational models. In fact, analysts now agree that the A380 was built for a market that had significantly shrunk by the time it entered service. As a result, Production ended in 2021, with only 254 units built, 13 of which have already been dismantled. Despite this, some airlines found the A380 suitable for their operations, including Qantas, Australia's flagship carrier. Qantas ordered 12 A380s for delivery starting in 2008, eight of which remain in service as of 2024. The first of these, registered as Via Chow Khoi and named Nancy Bird Walton in honour of the pioneering Australian aviator, was the one scheduled to fly from Singapore to Australia that day. The Airbus A380 is powered by four massive Rolls-Royce RB211 Trent 900 high-bypass turbofan engines, each capable of producing up to 84,000 pounds of thrust. The aircraft was nearly full, with 440 of its 450 passenger seats occupied and a considerable crew of 29 on board, including five pilots. While the A380 typically requires only two pilots, Qantas had also assigned a second officer as a relief crew member. Additionally, a line check pilot was overseeing the captain's performance and another check captain was training the first check pilot, making for a crowded cockpit. Commanding the flight under observation was Captain Richard Champion de Crespigny, aged 53, a seasoned aviator with over 15,000 flight hours and 35 years in aviation. The other crew members included First Officer Matt Hicks, Second Officer Mark Johnson, Czech Captain Harry Woburn and Senior Czech Captain David Evans. At 9.56 a.m., the Qantas A380 began accelerating down the runway. The takeoff was smooth and the plane set course for Australia. Flight 32 proceeded southeast across the strait toward Indonesia, passing over the densely populated island of Batam. All parameters appeared normal as the A380 climbed toward an altitude of 6,500 feet. Seconds later, at 7,000 feet, the number two engine, located near the fuselage on the left side, exploded, sending a violent jolt through the aircraft. The resulting debris tore through the engine casing and nacelle as if it were butter, creating a clear circumferential fracture around the engine. In an instant, one of these turbine disc fragments shot downward and to the left, hurtling toward the ground, while several more pieces travelled in the opposite direction. One fragment was ejected to the right, piercing the belly of the aircraft below the cargo hold, severing multiple structural beams and cables before exiting through the opposite side of the fuselage. 
Two more fragments were propelled upward, slicing through the left wing. Numerous smaller fragments, including dislodged turbine blades and pieces of the engine structure, scattered across various parts of the plane, including the wings and fuselage. On board, the pilots and passengers heard two distinct explosions in quick succession, followed by a sudden and overwhelming cascade of warnings in the cockpit. The aircraft veered to the left and the autothrottle system disengaged. Recognizing the severity of the situation, Captain de Crepigny activated the autopilot's altitude hold function to level the aircraft, and the crew's attention immediately turned to the ACAM system. The ACAM screens, a hallmark of most modern passenger aircraft, have revolutionized how pilots manage in-flight emergencies, enabling quick and accurate responses to almost any conceivable mechanical failure. The first message on the screen was an engine 2 turbine overheat warning, followed in the next 20 seconds by 34 additional alert messages. The crew decided to shut down the engine. The pilots also attempted to activate the two fire extinguishers integrated into the engine, but only one discharged successfully. As they worked through the seemingly endless list of alerts on their screens, it became clear that the engine and its extinguishers were not the only systems in trouble. When the turbine disc fragments tore through the wing and the A380's belly, they caused significant secondary damage. The left wing's fuel tank was punctured, leading to a leak. The mechanism for extending the leading edge slats took a direct hit, and the plane's electrical system sustained major disruptions. Additionally, two large cable bundles were completely severed, affecting approximately 650 cables critical to the functioning of nearly every imaginable system on the A380. One of the most serious failures was the loss of one of the aircraft's two hydraulic systems. Unlike other wide-body aircraft, the A380 has only two hydraulic systems, primarily serving the left and right sides of the plane, respectively. At this point, the crew faced a critical decision. Should they attempt an immediate landing, or should they remain airborne to address all the abnormal procedures associated with the dozens of error messages? After assessing that the aircraft could be controlled with the autopilot both engaged and disengaged, they ultimately decided it was safe to remain in the air. Having chosen this course of action, the crew requested clearance to enter a holding pattern, which ATC granted, allowing them to circle over the ocean northeast of Singapore. The crew estimated it would take at least 30 minutes to work through all the ACAM procedures. Meanwhile, the flight attendants were trying to get the pilot's attention using the emergency call button, but everyone was so focused on the failures that they initially didn't notice. It was only when second officer Mark Johnson was sent to assess the situation in the passenger cabin that a Qantas pilot, traveling as a passenger on the upper deck, caught his attention. The pilot pointed to the in-flight entertainment system, which displayed a live feed from a tail-mounted camera. The digital transmission clearly showed a large fuel leak streaming from the left wing. Johnson proceeded to go downstairs to verify it himself and, for the first time, noticed two massive holes in the top of the left wing surrounded by jagged metal, where turbine disc fragments had exited. All passengers are watching the tail camera on their screens, seeing the fuel leaking. Should we turn it off? I think it's better to leave it on. Turning it off might cause more panic. They could think something worse has happened. On the ground, events were taking an unexpected turn. On the island of Batam in Indonesia, debris from engine number two had fallen into a populated area shortly after the failure. Among the debris was a large section of the turbine disc, which struck a building with such force that it shattered a brick wall. Fortunately, no one in Batam was injured by the debris. However, photos soon surfaced on Twitter of locals holding pieces of the plane, 
some showing what appeared to be Qantas livery, leading to speculation that a Qantas aircraft had crashed somewhere over Batam. The news that a Qantas A380 might have crashed spread so rapidly that even investors reacted by selling shares while the plane was still airborne. In fact, the CEO of Qantas first learned of the situation when he received a call asking why the company's stock price was plummeting. In the air, such concerns were far from the crew's minds. Working through one ACAM procedure after another, they slowly stabilized several malfunctioning systems. But as they did so, one particular issue was worsening. The fuel situation. Another alert. Looks like we'll never finish today. The system shows a significant weight imbalance between the wings. We've lost almost all the fuel from the left wing. The system not only displayed this imbalance, but also suggested opening the crossfeed valves to transfer fuel from one wing to the other. However, the pilot's experience told them not to follow this recommendation. It wouldn't be the first time an aircraft ran out of fuel due to such an action. In the end, it took 55 minutes to clear all the aircom messages, an unprecedented amount of time far exceeding what the pilots had anticipated when they started. Yet, even with that completed, other considerations had to be addressed before attempting to land. Notably, the plane was still 40 tons above its maximum landing weight, and among the systems that had failed was the fuel jettison system. This meant they couldn't reduce weight except by staying airborne longer. However, with the growing fuel imbalance between the wings and a 65% loss of roll control, the pilots determined it would be irresponsible to delay further. They concluded they needed to land soon, even if it meant exceeding the maximum landing weight. How much runway would they need to stop the massive, overweight A380? Using software installed on their laptops, the crew inputted various parameters such as weather conditions, runway state and any system failures to calculate whether landing was feasible. But when all the data was entered, the program returned an unhelpful result. No outcome. Senior Czech Captain David Evans managed to resolve the issue by manually inputting the data, and finally, they had an answer. The software indicated they would need at least 4,000 meters of runway to land, leaving only a 100 meter margin. With the landing plan ready, the captain took the aircraft out of its holding pattern and began maneuvering for approach. The crew requested fire trucks to be on standby due to the fuel leak and instructed the cabin crew to prepare for a potential ground emergency in case they overran the runway. However, the challenges were not yet over. Gear down. It's not working, Captain. The landing gear isn't deploying. The hydraulic system failure was making its presence felt. Not only was maneuvering the aircraft more challenging, but now the landing gear wouldn't deploy. The pilots were forced to use the emergency gear deployment system, which involves unlocking the gear doors and allowing the landing gear to fall into place under its own weight. Miraculously this worked, and the landing gear deployed quickly. At 11.46 a.m., just under two hours after takeoff, a brief stall warning sounded just before touchdown. A fraction of a second later, the plane was on the ground. The pilots applied the brakes that were still operational, engaged reverse thrust on engine three, and hoped it would be enough. When the aircraft came to a stop, only 150 meters of the 4,000 meter runway remained.
And yet, even at that moment, while some passengers thought their ordeal was over, more problems emerged. When the pilots shut down the engines, they noticed the left main landing gear brakes had overheated alarmingly. These were the only functioning brakes on the left side of the aircraft and had been under significant strain during the landing, causing them to overheat. This in turn led to the deflation of four tires. To make matters worse, fuel continued to leak from the left wing, raising genuine concerns that it could ignite if it came into contact with the overheated brakes. Additionally, when engines 3 and 4 were shut down, the aircraft lost electrical power. Attempts to start the auxiliary power unit failed because the electrical distribution system was damaged. When the crew contacted the fire brigade, the captain urged them to cool the brakes. However, the lead firefighter responded with surprising news. Engine number one was still running despite the crew having performed the shutdown procedure. If the firefighters approached the engine too closely, they risked being sucked into the intake or suffering severe burns from the exhaust, not to mention the potential explosion of the reactor. Nevertheless, the firefighters managed to get close enough to spray foam on the brakes, preventing a conflagration. In the end, it took an hour to evacuate all passengers through a single exit in an orderly manner. Remarkably, all 440 passengers disembarked without injuries. As for engine number one, which was still running, Qantas engineers ultimately concluded that the only way to shut it down was to smother it with firefighting foam. The firefighters then poured large quantities of foam and water into the intake, which finally worked. The engine gradually wound down and stopped at 2.53 p.m., over three hours after the plane had landed. What had caused the explosion in engine number two of the Qantas A380? The news that the stricken Qantas A380 had landed safely in Singapore brought immense relief to everyone, especially those on board. The crew was immediately praised for their professionalism and composure. In an exemplary act of leadership, Captain de Crespigny even shared his personal phone number and spent two hours in Qantas's Singapore lounge answering passengers' questions about the flight. This incident involving the Airbus A380 followed two previous incidents with Rolls-Royce Trent 900 engines. In September 2009, an engine failure occurred on a Singapore Airlines flight from Paris to Singapore. And in August 2010, a Lufthansa flight from Tokyo to Frankfurt experienced an engine issue that led to an engine shutdown due to low oil pressure. On August 4, 2010, the European Union Aviation Safety Agency issued an airworthiness directive requiring inspections of Rolls-Royce Trent 900 engines. After disassembling the engine, Rolls-Royce technicians examined its remains. They found that a turbine disc had expanded excessively due to extreme heat exposure. Apparently, the turbine had overspun beyond its tolerances. Eventually, it was determined that a one-inch diameter oil pipe had fractured spilling lubricant onto the overheated turbine and causing it to catch fire. The pipe was found to have defective and weak inner walls, which led to its rupture and the subsequent oil leak. In total, 39 Rolls-Royce Trent, 900 turbines with the same defective oil pipe design were replaced. On June 22, 2011, Qantas announced it had accepted compensation of approximately $100 million from Rolls-Royce. The A380 was repaired at an estimated cost of $145 million.